glad to be able to spend a few moments with you, Peter, at your home here on South Street in the village. Uh, I, I wanted to start out by asking you about your family's origins. I know that the, I believe it's actually the oldest grave site next to the stone church and one of the oldest grave sites in the town of Rhinebeck is the grave site of a Zipperly. Uh, can, now, is that individual uh, have any connection with Peter Sipperly? It could have, but I, <laughs> to tell you the honest truth, I don't know. Okay. We do have, we've had Sipperly families contact us about our history, but uh, due to the, the history of our family, we just aren't sure of how far back we go. So I can't, can't give you a definitive answer about I, that. I know that there is that Palatine background and at the Historical Society, we've had a lot of research requests uh, from folks who have descended from that, uh, from that family. And I know that that was a few hundred years ago. Well, my grandfather, uh, he was adopted he was actually uh, adopted by the Sipperleys, but he was a relative of the Sipperleys. So he wasn't uh, a stranger to the Sipperley family because he was related to them. I understand. Uh, and that's where it gets a little complicated. <laughs> sure. So, the original spelling was Z-I-P-P-E-R-L-I-E. That's as far as back as we can trace. But uh, uh, my grandfather was actually a warden. And the wardens were a very famous Eastern New York family. John Worden was the commander of the Monitor in the Civil War and became a admiral in the Civil War after that was decorated by Lincoln personally because they figured the Monitor was the first battle that the North won <laughs> after the war started because the South was <laughs> winning a lot of the battles. So the Worden family were quite prominent and uh, Samuel Worden was a famous blacksmith who lived in Rhinebeck, and uh, he and his wife, uh, they lived in this area. They are not sure which Worden was my father's, my grandfather's real father, but he was adopted by the Sipperleys, and as I say, the Sipperleys and Wordens and the Mans were all interrelated. So that's part of our family history. So you go back quite a few generations That's correct. here in Rhinebeck. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your earliest memories? Now you were born here in Rhinebeck, Peter? In this house. Wow, <laughs> right here at 38 South Street. That's right. Wow. And uh, I uh, started school, uh, the school, the original elementary school burned in 1939 and uh, at that time my brother was in the sixth grade in that building when it burned right across from your house right across from the house I can remember the excitement I don't remember seeing the fire but uh, uh, my it happened in April and uh, as I say that was quite a situation because it was close to the end of the school year and they had to scramble to get uh, classrooms set up after the fire and they were able to do that very quickly. I don't know how they were able to do it so, so fast, but they did. Uh, so I went, when I started school in 41, First and second grade was in the Methodist parsonage, which was right across, kind of across from the 
that area. From the village, across from the village hall on East Market Street? Uh, on East Market Street. The building is still there. And then the 7th and 8th grade was the Catholic uh, parish hall. That building is still there. The 4th, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th was the Duchess Inn, which was a big building behind Ruggie's service station, which is no longer there. And uh, eventually they added a kindergarten, which was on... Uh, uh, they added a kindergarten... Uh, that was on one of the other local streets. And they also... <laughs> Uh, there was a garage that they added a, a seventh, a, a, they needed a seventh and eighth grade additionally and they added a, a, a garage, there was a garage that was available and they turned that into classrooms. So over time, they had classrooms scattered all over the village. So this would have been in the 19, that, that fire was in 1939, so not, you're talking about in the 1940s. 40s and 50s, and of course the, the new school wasn't open till 52, that's when they opened it. And uh, there was a hold up, of course the Korean War came in, in there, but that, there was a strike, a steel strike, which held things up. Uh, the Korean War really didn't hold anything up but the steel strike did. One of the proposals, uh, Peter, for the new school, actually the new school, the current, what's currently the high school and the current Bulkley School is kind of over in that direction. Uh, where, uh, but one of the proposals that I've seen was to have it located on land right across the stream here. And it would have uh, cut across your property. There were other proposals as well. Do you remember some of those discussions? Uh, you, you would have been, I guess, what, in, uh, in high school at the time when? No, uh, the original, the first proposals uh, that they voted on, I think I was in the seventh or eighth grade, and they talked about the property where the library is now. Where the Star Library that is located. That was where the first proposals were going to be. And they voted that down. And the first proposals were quite expensive. And I think that was the first thing that turned the public off. I see. Uh, it was, they just didn't feel that they could go that high tax-wise. Uh, I don't recall I think the other proposal that they were considering was the property up on the hill here. Uh, uh, Over on, still on South Street. On South Street. Where there's a private home today. Yeah, I think they, they were talking about that property uh, due to the fact that it was close to the, the high school. Uh, I don't recall that as being ever put on the ballot, but it was discussed. Uh, beyond that, I'm not just sure when the proposals for the present location, when that came up. That finally passed in 1949. That's when they passed it. And they lowered the expectations to the point where people that that they could handle that. Right. So. And then by 1952, the new building was in place. Well, it was funny that night when it, when it passed, they had a torchlight parade. And I think everybody thought the thing was going to be built that day. <laughs> and, and of course, it took three or four years. And the people that, the students that thought that they were going to be in the new school very quickly were long gone. Sure. And uh, sure. Uh, as I say, we were the first class to graduate from the new school that spent the entire year in the new school. Now, the year before, they they had moved into the, the new school like in April. So they spent, that class spent maybe two months in there 
then they graduated. But we were the first class to be in there the, the, the entire year. Peter, your professional career has been as a plumber. And Correct. you've served many homes here in the community. At, at what point did you decide that that's the direction you were going in? Well, my brother and I, <laughs> we did very good in school. Your brother being? My Vernon. brother Vernon. Vernon Sipper. He was uh, six years older than me, graduated quite a bit ahead of me. And we both did very well in school. We took classes that were, well, maybe a little. I was good in math and good in business. He took all languages, Latin and French. But I think we both decided when we graduated that was the end of the books. <laughs> We had been born into the business. We started working in the business. He probably started at 12. Maybe I was a little bit older than that when I started in the business. You know, you start you start working in the business a little bit at a time, and you grow into it. And uh, we did. We had our ups and downs, and we and uh, we made it. And we made it successful. And, uh, we were one of the few few businesses that, when we closed the business, we were still operating under the same family that started the business. Hobson's was one of the others that did that also, but most of them, over time, they sell out. They keep the the family name, but they sell out to other people. But uh, if you're able to keep the family in it, that's that's a good thing. So the sign that we see, we used to see in front of the adjacent building here that said Estate of Sipperly, that, that that's a reference to an earlier generation. That here. what happened when my grandfather died, he had no will. What was his name? His name was Calvin Edward, C.E. That's where the C.E. came from. And nobody ever called him Calvin. Edward, Eddie was his, his he was known as Eddie, Eddie Sipperly. So he died without a will. He had, and it took some number of years to get that squared away. That's why they had to put a state of in front of his name. That, was a legal problem that they had to continue. If they continued the business, they had to put a state of in front of his name. So that, that's why that was continued. Well then, when we incorporated in 1962, the state allowed us to keep the state, the estate of in the incorporation. Uh, Normally that is not done that way, but they allowed us to do it because the estate had been on the name so long, they, they said, okay, you can do it. So we did. So, uh, that's so, what. so as a, so with, with you and your brother Vernon running the business, you were probably the only game in town for a good number of years as a plumber. Well, Bus Van Curen, who was right up on the corner, uh, Bus started with my grandfather. He started, uh, uh, Van Curen's lived, there was a house right across from my house on the corner, and Van Curen's lived in that house, and uh, eventually it was torn down and became part of the Catholic Church property. This uh, is at the corner of South Street and South Mulberry. Street and in the Mulberry Street. At the and, northeast corner. And uh, Bus was war born in that house. He was the youngest of three children. And uh, he used to spend a lot of time. My grandfather, he and my grandfather, you know, he, he eventually worked for my grandfather as a plumber. And then he eventually 
went in business for himself. Uh, after he went in service during the Second World War, and then he set up his business after he came back. And he eventually bought the property up on the corner of uh, South Parsonage and South Street. So, uh, Boss had his business there, we had our business there. Eventually, Carol Melick had a uh, hair, hair business up on the next block on South Street. So there were a few businesses on the street, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, there was no, no big, big deal about it. Uh, and I think there are other people that had had small businesses that they had out of their house. And uh, chiropractor was in this building next to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything worked out. It was no, no big deal. We had, <laughs> at one time, our business employed almost 12 people. And, uh, uh, but as time went on, uh, I would say probably there was more competition involved and uh, we reduced the number of employees down and eventually got down into the, when we uh, finally sold our business, we were down to like my brother, myself and one part-timer and that was it. You, in the course of the business, which was quite a few years, you. I'm sure you saw some really fascinating people, some interesting situations, some real challenges for a plumber. Uh, but are there one or two highlights that you're able to share with us from some of the people that you met or some of the unusual situations that you ran into? Well, Tracy Dow's sent my grandfather up in business. Now, there was quite a story involved with that. I won't get into that too much, but uh, a situation developed, and uh, the, plumber, the plumber that Tracy had uh, crossed him up. And my grandfather had been working for this gentleman and apparently what happened, Tracy Dows gave the plumber money Christmas time. He said, I want you to, I want everybody on the property to get a, a lunch pail as my gift for, for Christmas. Well, the gentleman kept the money and didn't buy the presents. <laughs> and he found out about it. So he went to my grandfather and said, I want you, I said, I'll give you the money. I want you to be the plumber for my property. He said, I'll get you jobs for some of the other river people that I know would, would hire you to work. Which he did. Dell knows, Astor's got my grandfather to work with them and he fired fired the guy said I don't want you on the property again they're gone and I don't know how much money was involved or anything about it and that was the whole issue and, uh, he was out my grandfather was in he <laughs> he bought him a Flanders car and uh, that was part of the deal. He gave him some money to get going, and he also lent him some money. And I have somewhere in my file a copy of the, 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 the loan deal. It was on a piece of paper. <laughs> it seemed to me it was like $1,500. Just signed, signed in pen. Uh, <laughs> that's all there was to it. No, no big deal. And uh, this was in 1912 Wow! I started. And uh, my grandfather bought 
the original piece of property and there was a building on it that he used for the original plumbing shop. And he got going, uh, uh, as I say, with the help uh, Tracy Dow's got him, uh, worked with the river people, and then once he got established, uh, then that's when uh, 1912 people were starting to put indoor plumbing in, and uh, they were also putting in the uh, water mains for the village then. Uh, they started in 1900, actually. That's when the uh, original uh, water system was being, starting to be installed. So, Peter, the period you're talking about, right around uh, 1900, would have been when Frank Teal was working for the village, uh, doing some of the uh, uh, surveying that was necessary. I think he had been hired as village engineer around that time. That could work very well be. So your grandfather probably would have worked uh, with him then, I guess, by 1912 or I, I would say that probably was. definitely. Probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the uh, Tracy Dows in the period that you're talking about, uh, if my memory is correct, uh, would have been the head, not only the person who was in the process of putting together what we now know as Southlands, but he had moved here from Irvington and had become the head of the board at the bank, at the, what was the Rhinebeck uh, Savings Bank, today the Rhinebeck Bank. Uh, but uh, Frank Thiel made some decisions in that role in terms of supporting the start of certain businesses that really made a big difference for the future of the community. Well, Tracy Dows was also head of the Rhinebeck Realty Corporation, yeah. and also he owned the Beekman Arms. And uh, uh, as time went on, now my aunt Florence kept the books for the Beekman Arms, and she also uh, was bookkeeper for the, the hospital and for all for the Rhinebeck Gazette. So uh, uh, she knew, and she, she also did actually Tracy Dow's private uh, book, uh, for his private bookkeeping. Uh, so she had a, a, a pretty good knowledge of his situation. Of course, he liked being up here. He didn't like, uh, his wife liked the nightlife. She was more inclined to like, I think, I don't know if they were more inclined to uh, she liked uh, nightlife in New York City and maybe Washington and like right. that. But he wanted, he liked it more up here. This is Alice Olin Dow's right. that you're talking about, uh, Tracy's and, wife. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, they, uh, I think eventually, they separated a little bit. They didn't, yes, they there did. was a little bit there's something going on there. Right. Uh, she stayed in Washington, D.C. He moved to London. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe he eventually died in London. But uh, she she stayed pretty much by herself. Down well, in she, she lived, she was quite old. I mean, she lived, uh, she lived in the house next to the hillside fire firehouse there. She was still alive in the 1960s and uh, you're talking about Deborah Dows now. no I'm talking about Alice Alice the mother okay uh, there was they they always call it the pink house it was a house next to the hillside firehouse and she lived there as late as in the early 1960s and uh, she used to go I know she went to concerts uh, down the, uh, the Mills Mansion, they had concerts down there. Because my aunt Elsa used to go to those concerts. Uh, Daisy Suckley and different ones, Helen Hall, and they all used to get together down there. And uh, uh, I know uh, Alice, 
Alice Dow, Dow used to, she, she went to those concerts. Now she had to be well in her 80s at that time, but she was still very active. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Tracy had, he had died quite some time before that. But, uh, but uh, as so, I say, he liked, he liked the country living. But he and my grandfather, they they really hit it off. And uh, he, he, as I say, he, he was responsible for us being. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so through uh, Tracy and through your grandfather, uh, the Sipperly business wound up having accounts then with some of the other River families as well. Who were who were some of those other families that you wound up doing work for? Well, we worked for Suckley's, we worked for uh, Delano's, we worked for Astor's, and uh, there were probably some others, uh, just not. Can you can you tell us a little bit about your experience with some of them, uh, the Suckley family, or the Delano's, or the Astor's? Uh, I don't uh, remember too much about it. Uh, my experience in later years, I, I remember working, uh, when I worked for Astor's, Vincent Astor had died, but Mrs. Astor was still, uh, the pres uh, Brooke Astor was still alive, right. and uh, she was very nice to work for. She would, you know, she would come and talk to you, and, and uh, she, was, she was there quite a bit of the time, and uh, they did a lot. Of, we did a lot of work over there for an outside water system. She she did a lot of work. Uh, see, Vincent Astor was buried on the property, which is unusual. Normally, he was buried in a cemetery, but she had him buried over there, and uh, she had a lot of uh, trees planted, and uh, there was a lot of work done on the property to really spruce it up, and. Uh, uh, we did a lot of that. We set up an outside water system that drew water from the river and uh, set that all up so in the summertime if it was dry there was plenty of water so that all the shrubbery and everything was, was well watered. And of course she was very active. They had a uh, at Madison Square Garden every year they had a flower show. She was very active in that, and uh, they had prizes and all. And of course, all the wealthier people competed against each other for, uh, for uh, actually for prizes. And uh, she she won a lot of ribbons. I remember that. She had a gardener who was really good at what he did, and uh, boy, he he did a lot on that property. Now, so, now, she lived uh, at Astor Courts or yeah, in that, the tea house? That's where she lived, Astor Court. Okay. And uh, uh, she spent a lot of time there. Uh, you, you mentioned a gardener. Was the garden right around Astor Courts or was it somewhere else in the Well, property? they had it. Uh, he raised the, the flowers and all. Not, that was not near Astor Court. It was uh, uh, over more toward River Road. There was a, an area over there where he did the gardening, uh, where he raised the flowers and all. And uh, uh, I can't can't remember his name, but uh, he uh, he really knew his stuff. And, and uh, of course, that they had a lot of acreage there, and there were a lot of ha oh, houses and uh, uh, she had quite a number of employees on the property to take care of them. So you you had this time that you had spent with uh, at the Astor property putting in a water system there but you also mentioned a uh, that you did work for the Delano's as well. We, we did I don't remember too much about the Delano's but we did uh, we did quite a bit of work up there for them. 
And, but Suckley's, we did a lot of work down there. At Wilderstein. And Wild Wilderstein and Wilder Cliff. Of course, they sold that, they subdivided that. And we worked, uh, uh, there were different families that bought bought and sold Wilder Cliff different times, and we worked for all of them. Sam Sam Hall was, was one we did a lot of work for the, for the Halls, and uh, of course Grayson, his wife, uh, she was an actress, and she was nominated for uh, Night of the Iguana. She didn't get it, but uh, uh, but they were great people. I mean, they were, you, could, you go there to work, and they were just average you know, they talk to you like anybody else would. They weren't high-class high people or anything like that. Sure. And, uh, oh, uh, so, and of course, Supply Daisy was fantastic. You go there anytime, and, uh, uh, at that time, they had set it up, uh, they set it up so that uh, she was taken care of. Uh, I guess she was just under 100 when she died. And uh, she always said, she said, I'll, I'll die in this house. I'm not going to be anywhere else. I'll, I won't be anywhere else. And <coughs> that's the way it was. So, so you must have had tea with her more than once. Uh, oh, yeah. She, uh, anytime you went down there to work, she always wanted to. She always wanted to serve you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyway, it was uh, a good experience. I mean, the river people were great to work for, and uh, they uh, it, it meant a lot to be able to do that. So, but they really, they're the ones that got got us started in business. No question about it. And there were obviously. Uh, Many many houses here in the village that uh, you, you to this day probably can remember where every broken pipe uh, happened to be, or the folks whose uh, pipes are exposed to the weather, or uh, whose uh, water heaters uh, didn't well, work quite right. My grandfather started when, as I say, indoor plumbing was just starting to to be an issue. And uh, they, they had just started to, to install the water mains and run the service lines into houses. So most of the houses were just starting to get cold water service. They didn't even have hot water at that time. They just had, had, a, had a faucet coming into the house and that was it. And most of them still had outdoor privies and uh, eventually they did get indoor plumbing, but, but uh, uh, as I say, just an indoor cold water faucet was originally what they had. That's what they started with. So, uh, Peter, after your, uh, I, I don't know at what year this happened, but you became mayor of this village, and you were mayor for many terms. 28 okay. years. Peter, you were mayor for a long period of time here in the village. I'm, I'm curious uh, what it is that persuaded you to even consider doing that thankless job. Uh, who came to you? Did, did somebody suggest that to you or how did that come about? All right. I was trustee first. Uh, 1967. Now what happened, the fire department was having problems and originally they were going to run a group, two trustees and a mayor that was pretty much going to represent the fire department. Uh, As I recall, it was going to be Gus Ebers was going to run for mayor, uh, DeWitt Grinnell and myself were going to run for the two trustee jobs. Well, 
Gus's wife didn't want him to run from here. And DeWitt, I guess DeWitt didn't think it was a good idea for him to run either. So I wound up being the only candidate. So Lindsay Madison was the one that was pushing me to run. Uh, he was involved with the fire department. The whole deal was the fire department thought they were getting shortchanged. There were issues that uh, they felt they weren't getting a fair shake from the village on the fire equipment and certain things. So anyway, I ran as an independent candidate, and that was in 1967, and I won. I came in second. Lou Asher got the most votes. He, he, he came in first. I came in second. So I was a trustee for two years, and they appointed me as being in charge of the fire department, which was what the fire department wanted. So that was when they had. They wanted to get plans in place for a new firehouse. The issue was that the, the old firehouse was much too small to house the equipment, plus the fact that the second floor had been condemned as being unsafe for public use. In other words, the floor was not safe for a large group to, to uh, hold meetings on. This is the building that is or was on West Market That's Street correct. right next to the Beekman Arms. Still right there, there and it's a, uh, they have uh, stores, I believe there are businesses in there. Right, right. So the fire department independently could have meetings on the second floor but you could not have public meetings on the second floor because uh, safety issues. They felt that, that the floor was not sufficiently uh, supportive enough to have it. And, uh, so anyway, the long and short of the thing is uh, we got a committee together and we hired an a architect. His name was Bruce Helms and he was from Katona. And he got the plans together. Uh, we had a one or two hearings. We invited the public. Uh, the deal was if we did not build a new firehouse, the state insurance would force the insurance people to raise the insurance for the village, like 25%. You would have to, that would be automatic because the old firehouse was, would not comply with what the state required. And the insurance people that had insurance agencies in Rhinebeck agreed with that. They said that is correct. The state is forcing us to raise your rates. So, Bob Shackleton, who was mayor at that time, decided not to run in 69. So he recommended that I run. So that's why I ran in 69. We also, they also put the, the plan up for a vote at that time. I ran on the phone. Nobody ran against me. But they also put the plan for the new firehouse up at that time. And it passed. So that was a good deal because we were able to start the firehouse at the same time I went out as mayor. And it made it a lot easier for me to get things going. So now we have a 
a fight as a result of your leadership as mayor and as the trustee initially who was responsible for the future of the fire department uh, we now have a new village hall the same building that serves as the fire department headquarters and the second floor of that building is certainly not only safe but holds a lot of people you, you must be very proud of that accomplishment well it was a it was a group issue I I kind of let it but the fire department and the community all kind of work together to make it work I I really don't want to take credit for it alone because it didn't quite work out that way everybody worked together to make it work and uh, it it, it did fall into place, uh, and the other thing, of course, Williams <laughs> had already moved up to his present location. Williams Lumber. Well, they Williams had Lumber owned that property, <coughs> so they sold it to the village at a very reasonable cost. And of course, Sandy, being a part of the fire department, that was also an issue to make make it work out even better so once once everything was in place uh, we started work on the, on the, we took bids on the village hall almost immediately after after that and uh, I think we went in in there in June of 71 that's when everything was complete so uh, they, they moved ahead on the construction pretty quick. So, so Peter, you're insisting that this is not something that you should take credit for, but there must be some other aspects of your accomplishments as a mayor. What, what is it that you feel proudest of from your 28 years, is it? as that you served as mayor? Yeah, 28 years. What what stands out? What what do you feel best about from all the issues that you had to tangle with over that time? Well, not not really anything in particular. Everybody kind of we all kind of worked together on the thing on on everything. Uh, sewage for the downtown area was important because uh, most of the, the buildings down there could not have been used the way they are today without the sewer system. And the Beekman Arms and uh, the Astor Home and uh, Foster's Coach House all were in a, a tough situation without the sewer system. And uh, that was very important. And we were able to get that at a very reasonable cost for the community because uh, the, fe the federal government paid a huge portion of that, that, uh, of that system. The state paid some, but the federal government paid most of it. And, uh, that really was, was extremely important. Uh, the uh, removing the parking meters, <laughs> that was great. Mike Facara, who was vice president of the bank, was responsible for getting the parking meters out and getting trees planted downtown that made the downtown area looked great and uh, it allowed people to park properly that couldn't park. The parking meters were designed for smaller vehicles and uh, it, it caused problems and getting them out of there and getting trees planted and making the, the downtown area look proper. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. Uh, 
it really made a huge difference. And businesses, then we put the community parking lot in across from the firehouse. That was a big deal. Uh, the gentleman that owned that property offered it to the village. If we would retire, if the village would retire the mortgage on the property, which was at that time $25,000, the village could have the property. So, what we did, uh, again, Mike Pacara was involved in this. He got the, the merchants to put up the $25,000. The bank was involved also. They paid off the mortgage. The village took control of the property, demolished. There was uh, the old community garage building was on it. We demolished that, cleared the property, put up the parking lot, and uh, that was it. So that was in 73, 1973. Uh, the parking lot was opened, I think, in June or July of 73. And then about, I think, five or six years after, we bought more property and added to that parking lot. But uh, the parking lot was a godsend because it uh, allowed people to park there in addition to the parking on the street. Uh, the businesses, you know, the, the businesses demanded more parking. And uh, it worked out real well. So. Over your many years, not just as a mayor, but as a resident of the village, you've, you've seen and been a part of many of the changes. Uh, but since the time that you left the position of mayor, you've seen additional changes take place here in the village. Uh, what kinds of changes do you see that you think have made uh, Rhinebeck a better place for the people who are here? I guess you knew with 9-11, that more city people have come up to the area. There's no question about that. Right. And there are people that live here now that commute back to the city every day. And of course, with uh, Winecliffe, it's it, it's been great for them because they can grab a train, commute every day. Some commute every day. Some have a, an apartment in the city, and they can stay down there and come up weekends, but they enjoy living in Rhinebeck or living in this area much much more than they do in the city. Uh, <clears throat> but I think uh, by the looks of things, they, they really enjoy the country with <laughs> some, some people see that as, as a, cite that as a source of change that they're not happy about. Others see that as a big plus to the community. I mean, the unhappiness is that these are families that they don't know the grandparents, they don't know, you know, they haven't been a part of the community for a long time. But on the other hand, uh, these are folks that contribute an enormous amount to the community in many cases. Uh, the kind of professional skills that they bring, the wealth that many of them bring, has made a difference to the businesses in the community. How, how do you see the impact? Well, I, when the sewage went in initially back, I think 86 is when we opened that sewer system, I knew there were going to be major changes. Now, I didn't know with 9-11 and that, that, that was going to be an issue. Right, right. But we knew that there were going to be major changes. And of course, with the uh, housing development uh, on Rhinecliffe Road back in there, that was a 
well, at the gardens. The gardens was going to be a change, and there were going to be major issues. And I knew that was going to come. And uh, I, I didn't see it as a, as a bad thing at all. And I mean, I think a lot of the people that came back in that time period really enjoyed the community. Now, whether the, the newer people fall into line with the community or whether they like it or whether they don't, I think eventually they will. Uh, I, I know <laughs> from living in the city and coming in, into a rural area might be a major change for, for some people. There's no question about it. But I think overall, uh, people will enjoy, you know, the Rhinebeck area. And, uh, uh, well, I was born into it. So. <laughs> I, I know that uh, actually that trend has been going on for a long time of increased cost of housing in the community. I remember uh, quite a few years ago Getting, trying to track down a gentleman you mentioned who had been mayor just before you, uh, Bob Shackleton. And he had uh, lived here for a good while, but then wound up moving to Kingston. And I remember asking him what it had. He said it just got uh, too expensive to live here in the community. And, uh, and to see somebody who devoted so much of his energy to the community finding himself in that kind of position. Um, I, have you seen others in similar situation? And if so, what's, what's your take on that? Well, I don't see myself as moving out. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that. <laughs> I, it may be more expensive. It's a tough thing to say. Now, I know if you may remember going back some time, we were under pressure with some of these so-called millionaires that wanted to turn Rhinebeck into a city. Remember these housing developments that they talked about? You know, they were going to build all these houses and have these stores and all this stuff. And the people really didn't want anything like that. And uh, they had a couple of big hearings at the fairgrounds and uh, nobody got up and spoke in favor of having anything like that. And I think that was the big issue right from the start that Rhinebeck was not going to be turned into a city. It was going to be remain rural and acceptable to the people that were living in it. And I think it still is, and it still is going to stay that way. And I think the people that come here to live are going to enjoy it that way. But uh, it, it, uh, you're going to have changes, there's no question about it. But I think the changes are going to be limited. Uh, it's going to be more expensive in some regard, that's true. Uh, but I think overall, I just am not interested in <laughs> going somewhere else. Okay. And I think a lot, of, a lot of the older people feel the same way. So, uh, uh, we do have, we have the woods and we have the village green. Uh, people that felt they didn't want to mow, mow a lawn or maintain a house anymore could go there, you know, and a lot of them did and enjoyed it and uh, spent their final years there. And of course we have uh, the, uh, well, the, Assisted living facilities. Assisted living. That's what I'm trying to think about. It. Yes. Over and, at, uh, uh, yeah. So we do have the facilities locally to help people that need it. Sure. And uh, I think all the way around, uh, it 
it's a situation which is really good for our area. You know, it, 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 it's a hard thing, uh, people when they get old, I mean, <laughs> you're kind of looking at a, a situation, your family, a lot of them don't have families anymore, I mean, their, their families are gone, and like in my situation, uh, I have a son and daughter. But a lot of people don't even have that anymore. Right. And, right. Uh, so makes a lot of difference. You no, know, but if you have a place to go where you can spend your final years, that's great. So, uh, Peter, after your uh, 28 years as mayor of the village, uh, you didn't disappear from the scene. I know that uh, your replacement, Mayor Costa invited you to uh, serve in the position of highway superintendent. I had which, that nine years. Yep. Which you did. Uh, most people, once they're done with the mayor's position, they would say, enough. But how was that, working, uh, working after being the boss, telling everybody else what to do, all of a sudden you've got the new mayor who's uh, telling you what to do. Well, John and I were both good friends to begin with. It wasn't a contentious, when he, he and I ran against each other, it wasn't a contentious situation. Right. And I was on the fence to even run that time because my wife was very sick. She had multiple sclerosis. And it, this was just before she left the nursing home. And I was really on the fence about running that last time. And uh, it, it, Carl said that <laughs> my losing that election was the best thing that ever happened. Because I wasn't the only one either. <laughs> but John, John uh, apparently, I always said to John, I said, people don't think that we rigged it up that way. But uh, it was only like two weeks after that. that he, he asked me about taking the job out there. He said, you know, we're, we're going to have an opening. And uh, he said, I'd like you to take that job if you're interested. Well, my brother was going to have open heart surgery. And I couldn't run the business alone because it was just too much. So when John made the approach to me about taking the job, I called my brother. I said, this is the first chance we'll have to sell the business, close it, and he said, terrific. And I said, do it. So that's what we did. And, uh, <coughs> so you I, served for nine years in, so in the position of... Yeah, I had to, I had problems with my knee. I was starting to have physical problems at the end of the nine years. And John had already, he had uh, retired so I think Carol Mealick was mayor when I retired. And uh, I think that's the way that went. I had 30 years of part-time service and nine years of full-time service. And I thought that would end <laughs> my service <laughs> in public service. And then uh, Wayne Baden, called me and he said, would you be interested in serving on a board in New York City? And uh, so he explained it all to me and he said, now you're going to be, you would be appointed by the governor. He said, so he said, I'll make the recommendation to the governor and uh, you should be getting a letter on it, which I did. And that was in 2011. I've been on that board ever since. What it is, <coughs> it's a, the Black Car Workers' Compensation Board. They, uh, uh, when George Pataki was governor, they set it up. Chauffeurs in the, in the state can't get, couldn't get insurance. So, all the limousine drivers in New York State were uninsured. 
and a lot of them went out of business because if their drivers were injured, they had to pay out of pocket. So they, uh, Pataki got the legislature to pass a law, set the thing up, and uh, they set up, they have 11 on the board, board of directors, of which I am a member, and the governor has uh, three appointees. Three appointees. The union has three, and the the uh, the companies themselves have five. I think that's the way they got it worked out. So anyway, <clears throat> so you've been serving in this role since 2011. <laughs> I'm the only one on the board that's not a college graduate. I'm the oldest one on the board. And I'm the only one with public service experience. That was the issue. They wanted to get somebody on there that had public service experience. So uh, uh, he, he appointed me, and then he, uh, as I say, I, I've got the letters from him signed by sure. him. And uh, I'm in my 10th year now. Uh, so you, so 10 years on this board in New York City, 28 years as mayor, nine years as highway superintendent. <laughs> Peter, that's just an incredible amount of service. Well, if I, if I make it through next year, I'll have 50 years in public service. Wow. Nine, nine were full time and all the rest were full time. Well, uh, congratulations. But, uh, and Thank you for being available to talk about this, to share it with all of us. Well, I never, of course, I never cared much for publicity. Oh, no. That's why I never had a picture taken. You know, people have a tuxedo and all that stuff. Right, right. So, Are you sure you want to allow your son to film this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when the newspapers used to do a story, they'd say, do you have a picture of yourself? I said, bring your camera. So that, that was it. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, everything worked out, and I everything worked out the way I liked it to work out. I, I, as I say, I wasn't keen on publicity. People wanted to, uh, they made it whatever they wanted. I just, I felt the result was the important thing. That, that, that was it. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. I, I think we're going to conclude there. So, Peter, I appreciate we've been talking for more than an hour, I think. Oh, geez. I... <laughs> hour and a half almost. Oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to be at your home here on the riverside uh, i go by on the other side of your house many times but i've never been in the back here it's really delightful and i can see why you want to continue to live in the village and carl uh thank you for filming and uh for having arranged this you're very welcome getting back to panda of course i was always a huge supporter of panda right from the start and of course originally Panda was done live. Right. They, right. they didn't have the tape. So <laughs> if somebody said something off color, it went on anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I remember uh, the original board meetings were done live. And anybody that said anything that you didn't want to hear, you heard it. <laughs> so that was it. I don't know when they started taping. But the original office, or whatever they used for an office, was a stage of the town hall. Right. And right. Uh, right. Uh, that, that, that was it. So, but I, I know there was a lot of resistance to having Panda to begin with. And I, yeah. I, I told John Costa, I said, John, it's a good thing. And, and he was for it, of course. And, uh, 
But there were a lot of those that, that didn't think they should, they should pay, you know, they didn't want to pay for it. Right. It's all the more important today because we've lost our local newspaper. We haven't had a gazette right. since 2009, and even then it wasn't in very good shape. Um, and to be able to communicate with the community, uh, thank God we still have Panda as a public service. So. No, I still think it's an excellent thing. I, I, I don't know why people thought it was, wasn't a good thing. I, I still don't know why they did. <laughs> no. I happen to agree with you that it's it's a good thing. You and I have disagreed about other things, but uh, one of the things we can agree about is oh, the importance of uh, 